Hey Sam, I'm the co-chair of the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce here in New Jersey. October marks National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I, along with my co-chair, Jashjit Bindra, who's actually viewing us as, uh, who's tuned in as a viewer today, are pl uh, pleased to bring you a very relevant webinar. With many of us working from home nowadays, the topic of cybersecurity is now more relevant than ever. But before we share um, a message from our annual sponsors and provide you with some insight about the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to address a question that was arisen by one of our members today. And that question was, what differentiates the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce to other chambers of commerce around the world? And you'll have to excuse me here, I will be reading from uh, my screen. The Punjabi Chamber of Commerce is working hard to create a thriving business community for our entrepreneurs, professionals, students, inclusive of both gender and generation. As a community, we're looking to provide a platform that will generationally be passed down. And we aim to provide a membership in two ways. Sorry, we aim to provide our members value in two ways, both quantitative value, how much our business can, businesses can grow or the amount of revenue generated from becoming a member, but then also qualitative value. And what I mean by that is in the form of guidance, mentorship, uh, access to strategic networks, our chamber is more than just an, uh, senseless award ceremonies. We're looking to not just tackle today's issues, but foster a future community that has the tools to not just compete, but to excel. Do other chambers in the world do that? We have countless examples of how our Chamber of Commerce has tackled social issues. Our structure has a higher education director with deputies on New Jersey State uh, University campuses. We have a director of accountability to hold our own members accountable for scams and predatory behavior and misconduct. We have a special needs team that focuses on helping businesses become ADA compliant. We have corporate liaison directors sourcing internship opportunities and keynote speakers from various corporations, all for the benefit of the Punjabi community. Our leadership team is representative of our members, of the members we serve, regardless of age, the nature of their work and gender. We provide this free to every one of our members across 14 chapters across the globe. Now, you, have, you tell me, what exactly do we have in common with these other chambers of commerce? Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, pass it along to Sandeep, who's going to play uh, uh, a message from our annual sponsors, as well as an introduction to the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Sandeep, there's no sound. No sound. Yeah, if we can try that again. In neighborhoods across the country, you'll see gratitude. Communities showing support in their own way. Our way is Mass Mutual Health Bridge, a free life insurance program just for healthcare workers fighting COVID 19. So, to all the healthcare workers on the front lines, thank you. Hello, my name is Rekha Trivedi, and on behalf of the Mass Mutual family, I would like to thank all the healthcare professionals who've been fighting this war against Corona and keeping us safe uh, while selflessly working day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, it's a great pleasure to be partner with Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. This is Meena Chip, and on behalf of Mass Mutual Family, I would like to say thank you, PCC, for providing us this platform to say, convey our big thank you to the frontline workers who have been working uh, selflessly in fighting against this COVID-19 and keeping us safe. It's a great work, and we are here to help our community whatever way we can. Um, again, 
a big thank you BCC for having us on board. Thank you. It's a pleasure to partner with the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. We just want to say thank you to all the frontline workers who are helping us with this terrible situation of COVID-19. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to our sponsors and uh, Sandeep, if you have the second clip. Punjabi Chamber was formed to unite the global Indian Punjabi community. The way we do this is through creating a platform for giving. And it is in the platform on our website where people can connect and also help each other. So our real goal is to have everyone work together to make the community grow. One of the best things about PCC is the investor circle. It brings opportunities and investors together. Punjabi Chamber of Commerce has a website, punjabichamber.com, where you can get the list of the member directory. You can find the members by the location and the industry. Great discount programs for corporate members and professionals, such as restaurants, insurance, grocery shopping, tax preparation, and a lot more. Technology in serving the community for 15 last 15 years. As a current medical student, I'm really excited to use the Mentor Connect program offered by the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. We are the owner of Single Sing Distributor, who is distributing food products nationally in the US and Canada. And uh, we feel proud to be part of. Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. We are the trustee of Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. I'm a physician practicing inpatient and outpatient medicine. I'm also a trustee with the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. I'm involved because I want to help our community. I'm founder of Suhan Jewelers. This is my family business since 20 years. And thank you very much for Punjabi Chamber to helping my business. A chamber which brings all Pandavi brothers together and gives all the business people a bigger and a better platform to work together. I'm a news anchor in the Tri-State area. The Punjabi Chamber of Commerce gives me opportunity to learn from media professionals in the industry. Privileged to have this opportunity to mentor the younger generation coming into the business world. I'm so proud to do this thing, which I've been doing it for 30 years, and I'm so proud to do it for them. My name is Devinder Singh. I'm an investment banker. The Punjabi Chambers of Commerce gives me an opportunity to network with individuals in my industry. So we encourage you to visit our site and become a member today. Thank you.
Now, before we get started uh, with our panel today, um, an entrepreneur's guide to uh, security at her home, uh, sorry, at a business and a home. Uh, I'd like to introduce you all. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Director Jared Maples of the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness with us. Director Maples, over to you. Just wanted to make sure, can, I, can you hear me, uh, Indy? Yes, you're good, sir. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll be brief because I think I would guess that we're going to have a lot of uh, question and answers and, and conversation, which will, I hope, get the, uh, your membership uh, will glean some good knowledge out of that. I'll, I'll start out by saying it's an honor to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to, your, to this group, this chamber, the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce is certainly uh, well represented across New Jersey, and, and it sounds like even the country as we've done some research and learned more about your organization. So we're, it's a great honor to be here. Really, really excited to have this relationship and have the opportunity to speak uh, to all of your constituents and members, uh, in, including you and the leadership team. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll lead off there. I'll also say, and, and she's on here, and I'll have an opportunity, I know, to speak uh, as well. Um, but Krista Valenzuela was, was one of our senior analysts from the NJ Kick, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, uh, is on this call and is really a subject matter expert in everything that I'm going to discuss from an overarching cybersecurity piece, and then certainly down to the granular details of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day in the NJ kick in everything from intelligence sharing to operational security, et cetera, um, that we're responsible for across New Jersey. So I'll, I'll kick off and start there. Um, number one, first and foremost, our mission, a lot of people are unaware that states have homeland security agencies. Some states have a very large and robust presence. Obviously, New Jersey uh, is one of the larger, um, and New York, California, Texas, Florida, for example, have uh, very robust homeland security agencies and departments, um, along with New Jersey, like I said. And, and then there's some that are a little bit smaller and, and share duties with other entities. But we do have a state-based piece. Um, there's a large federal interaction. So my role as the director of the agency um, I'm also the Homeland Security Advisor to the Governor, which is a federal designation, and it allows me access into everything from Joint Terrorism Task Forces to the cybersecurity elements to preparedness with the home, federal Homeland Security. And I serve almost as like a National Security Advisor to the Governor uh, in that role. So it's really a two-parted role. Our mission as an agency, our role and what we play in, in the security of the state of New Jersey is we're responsible to lead and coordinate the state's counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and emergency preparedness efforts and wrapped into that is things like counterintelligence, uh, our critical infrastructure protection programs and what we do with the private sector, which I think is of note to this group, um, certainly, and, uh, and, and resiliency, building resiliency. So whether it be an attack in the cyberspaces or physical, uh, making sure, God forbid, if one happens here, we can be resilient um, as a community and as a state and overcome those, those concerns. Again, whether it be online in a cyber environment or in, in a physical environment, that becomes a, a real key factor in, in how we operate. Um, I think th this one obviously is going to be more geared towards our cybersecurity work. And again, Krista can speak to a lot of the specifics uh, of what they do. I'm sure she'll have some great material. She's always fantastic. But from an overarching perspective, New Jersey is the only state in the United States right now that cybersecurity and the state CISO uh, work for and, and operate under the umbrella of a Department of Homeland Security. So we're the only one right now, although a lot of states are moving in that direction. So other states' examples are uh, the, the, the person may report to the CTO or the CIO of the state or the governor directly or the National Guard. And in our case in New Jersey, we view it as a core homeland security discipline. And it allows us access to things. Again, it's becoming a best practice. I get calls every day or certainly weekly from my counterparts across the United States in, in federal and state on what we're doing, how we're doing it, what they can do to sort of model their presence after us. So I think in short order, you'll see a lot more of my colleagues in Homeland Security take on a broader responsibility for cyber that we do happen to have here in New Jersey. Um, a couple quick things about the NJ Kick. Uh, that's the New Jersey Counter, uh, Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell, the NJ Kick, which I'll refer to because that's a, a mouthful. I'll just call it the Kick or the NJ Kick. Um, that was created originally as a, an information and intel sharing platform, almost a, a, like a fusion center concept, making sure that best practices were being pushed out there. Threat stream intelligence was pushed out to the community, again, both public sector and private sector, uh, and down to the community level, federal, state, and local, et cetera. A real hub of, of uh, cybersecurity actions. And then over time, as the, as the NJ kick evolved and our cybersecurity mission evolved, there's an executive order in 2015 that officially placed cybersecurity underneath Homeland Security. And in doing that, we created and, and got in place the very first state CISO. This guy's, guy's name is Mike Garrity. 
Um, and he's one of my division directors at Homeland and then also is the director of the NJ Kick in his role. We wear a lot of hats around here. Um, and Mike, Mike has this incredible team under him, Krista, of course, being one of a, the, the uh, premier members there. But Mike himself has this unbelievable background from the private sector um, that we're very fortunate to have. You worked at the last role. Many of you have probably worked with them in your roles in the business world uh, with the Hudson's Bay Company, which is, the, I believe, if not the largest, one of the largest retailers in the world. Um, and, and he was this, the CISO for that. So he was running these incredibly complex retail-based and financial-based systems and making sure that those were secure for a multi-billion dollar, I mean, Fortune 50 level company. Um, and you know, when, he, when he finished up his service, he had started as a New Jersey State Trooper and came on board with us in, in Homeland Security um, following this robust private sector career. And I bring that up because we're coming at, from that angle. We're coming from this, it's, of course, we're a government agency, we're a security agency. Um, we have an immense security apparatus, but we do have a large scale knowledge base of businesses, how, how they operate, what they need, uh, and vice versa. And then the final piece of that that really comes into play, not just in talent that we have, but it's also, quite frankly, in, in using, utilizing the talent that you have in the private sector world, one, uh, to understand what the threats and needs are from you in the private sector and critical infrastructure sector in particular, but then also what we can do better, how we can provide information, data sharing, and then pull your expertise, right? So a lot of people always talk about the big banks, of course, have a huge presence. Uh, Mass Mutual, who just saw, and obviously has a huge presence in cybersecurity, and they spend to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars on cyber. And we try to take advantage of that, quite frankly, because we're, we are a government agency and there are finite dollars available in our tax base and our budget. And so we try to take advantage of relationships like this and really making sure we're engaging with the private sector uh, community across the board. Again, not just in giving resources for free, but then also in taking in some of the expertise and threat modeling that is apparent out there uh, in your world. So I'd, I'd say thank you for that. So our role in info sharing is pretty well established from what I just said, but then also they've rolled in and we've rolled in an operational perspective. So we actually are responsible for securing the NJ Garden State Network, the New Jersey Garden State Network, which is our IT infrastructure. And so every single day, Krista and her colleagues are responsible for monitoring, uh, targeting and finding out malicious actors. We block 4 million emails per day uh, on the Garden State Network. It's a, it's a 70,000 plus endpoints um, just in, in our employee base. And there's more endpoints even than that because multiple systems and servers that they're responsible to secure. And so we do that through a variety without getting into specific companies. They obviously have to be careful on who we endorse. We use a lot of the top tier companies out there, the available software platforms, uh, firewall platforms, uh, threat detection and networking detection uh, issue uh, platforms. We're really, quite frankly, I think at the top of the heap regarding our using uh, the private sector, uh, again, in their capabilities, whether it be through contractual relationships or volunteering from their part and making sure we're, we're ahead of the curve. The final thing I really wanted to talk about is training and awareness. So we have a huge campaign that talks about what's going on in the cyber world, best practices, things like changing your passwords, um, and updating your servers, updating your, your routers, making sure those, those really good tried and true cybersecurity programs are in place and, and platforms. Cyber hygiene uh, is something we talk a lot about. And, and things like if you get attacked by ransomware, we actually have over 50% of the known strains of ransomware. We have the, the de-encryption keys available for free at our NJKIC website. Um, and I'll get into that, but it's cyber.nj.gov. That's the website, cyber.nj.gov. We'll happily give you the slides any slides you see today and certainly all of our information, including our website and where you can contact our great team uh, to make sure you're connected in there. But we do encourage you to become members of that. You can get there again at cyber.nj.gov. And that gets you access to things like those best practices, real-time threat intelligence. We're getting it from the FBI, federal DHS, the intelligence community at the federal level, our state partners. We're pushing that, and our private sector partners, we're pushing that out real time. And being a member entitles you to get those updates and make a more secure company on your part or your community. Uh, it goes right down to your families and, and everyone else. So, um, and I see Krista just posted the cyber.nj.gov, which is fantastic. Thank you, Krista. Um, I'd say, I said she was fantastic. Um, I, I, I think it's important to note that we are here. We, are, we try to make all of this free to the population, and we really encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, I know it's a big panel. I don't want to take too much more time now, but happy to answer questions. And, and again, really honored to be here and uh, looking forward to, to being a part of the panel.
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today. My name is Anand Darya. I serve as uh, Director of Technology um, for Punjabi Chamber of Commerce here in New Jersey. Uh, after our moderated panels, our Accountability Director, Rachid Datta, will introduce you to all of our New Jersey leadership team, uh, as well as the initiatives we look forward to bring you, bringing you later this year. Uh, now, allow me to introduce you to uh, our moderator for today's discussion, Antoinette King, uh, a key account manager with Access Communication. Antoinette has 20 years of experience in the security industry and is board certified physical security professional, participating in a number of industry associations, including Women in Security Global Council, Women in Security Publication Committee, the Strategic Alliance Committee, Data Privacy Advisory Board, Cybersecurity Advisory Board, and Women in Cybersecurity. Thank you, Internet, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so I think right now what we'll do is start uh, by introducing our panelists. So if I can ask all the panelists to please turn their cameras on. Perfect. Um, we're going to start today with Harvey. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. I'm honored to be uh, moderating this panel on such an important topic that most of us are very, very uh, passionate about. And um, so I'd like to introduce our esteemed colleagues here. So I'll start with Harvey. Um, Harvey Garchet has been working uh, in the mobile phone security sector for the past 17 years. Harvey, why don't you give us a little bit about yourself? You're muted. <laughs> oh, yes. uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, thanks. And thanks for having me today. Uh, like you said, 17 years um, been working in the mobile sector uh, for smart technology um, and more really in the circular economy. So, for example, you, got, you guys have got a new iPhone coming out this week. There's going to be millions of uh, trading transactions taking place in your in in the usa and how do we make sure that these phones are uh, returned wiped securely um, go through all the different processes and then they are actually resold to um, the general public again so my my company over the last um, since 2004 have been taking care of these type of processes and developing technologies to um, support the whole infrastructure uh, behind this and that involves a lot of um, security software um, a lot of cloud checking making sure that the phones are um, ending up back in in the right place and phones which end up in the wrong place obviously diverting them back into the right place so yeah that's that's uh, my my back background um, as a real high level summary Obviously, with 17 years of work, I will um, add to your questions and answer whatever I can um, join this, uh, uh, join these talks over the next uh, hour or so. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Harvey. Uh, Krista, next we'll go with you. Um, Krista Valenzuela is a senior uh, cyber threat and uh, intelligence analyst with the New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell. That's a mouthful. Um, so, so Krista is the lead cyber threat intelligence and analysis, and analysis bureau. Krista, tell us a little bit about all of what you do. <laughs> we like long names, I guess, <laughs> the NJ Kick. <laughs> so we call it the NJ Kick because it is such a mouthful. Um, but I have been with the NJ Kick for about actually over five years now. Um, and I lead our cyber threat intelligence and analysis bureau within the NJ Kick. Uh, we have just a few of us, um, and part of what we do is developing our weekly bulletin that comes out every Thursday. Uh, we author the products that are available on our website. Uh, as the director mentioned, cyber.ng.gov. There's a variety of resources available on that website um, for all the listeners here today, um, for guides on how to better secure your systems, um, more home life, as well as uh, your work life, things that you can implement to make sure that you're more cyber secure. So that's really our charge, uh, Danja Kick, is making sure that the public, as well as uh, our state resources are secure. Um, so that's what I've been doing for over five years now. And then prior to that, I was with the Department of Defense, uh, working their information assurance mission. So very similar to what I'm doing now. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for, for having me. That's fantastic. And thank you for the work that you do. It's very, very important. Um, and finally, my friend Vikas, 
So Vikas Bhatia is the founder and CEO of Just Protect, also my co-host on, uh, I'll do a little shameless plug, on hatching <laughs> out the supply chain. <laughs> Vikas, why don't you tell us a little bit about Just Protect and some of your background? Okay, thanks Antoinette. Thanks Indy for pulling this together. Very important topic. Um, Vikas Bhatia, uh, founder and CEO of Just Protect. Uh, I have a 20 year cyber background. Uh, I actually started out as the IT guy uh, back in uh, the dot com era and um, through a bunch of viruses, through a bunch of disasters, landed a career in cybersecurity or, or what we know today as cybersecurity. Uh, I've been uh, similar to Krista, I've done uh, you know, security operations for the Ministry of Defense in the UK. Uh, I wasn't as good technically, so I became a consultant. <laughs> I landed in the big four. I did uh, almost eight years at Deloitte where um, I was uh, actually responsible for one of uh, Deloitte's first implementations of a security event monitoring solution. So I was the national lead for cyber threat intelligence and uh, incident response uh, close to 10 years ago. Uh, after leaving Deloitte, I sat at my own consulting firm providing retained CISO enterprise risk services. Uh, one of our clients was the Federal Reserve in New York, uh, where I helped them redesign their uh, third party risk management program, uh, which actually landed me with Just Protect. So Just Protect is a, uh, secure, is a software as a service platform that helps organizations of all sizes accelerate risk assessments, both internally and, and within third parties. And also I'm Antoinette's co-host on hashing out the supply chain, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> We'll send you the link to that on a separate episode. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to uh, getting deep into this discussion. So I wanted to start out with just kind of painting a picture, giving everyone a little bit of an overview of where cybercrime is right now. So global cybercrime revenues have reached a staggering $1.5 trillion per year, with the average price tag of a data breach estimated at just under $4 million per incident. And despite these jaw-dropping statistics, uh, there remains this common belief amongst many small to mid-sized businesses that the greatest vulnerabilities lie with the larger organizations, and it, that just isn't true. There's mounting evidence that shows that small to medium businesses are more vulnerable now than ever, and they're being targeted more. Uh, complacency regarding this reality can have disastrous consequences, and at the end of the day, the risk is real, and the data, if, if an um, organization faces a data breach, a small to medium business, they can lose everything as a consequence. Um, so today we wanted to discuss a little bit about some of the things that business owners, business owners can do to improve their cyber pasture both at home and in their businesses. So when we think about starting a new business, we think about hiring um, and engaging people for legal counsel, maybe we hire an accountant, we put some money aside for marketing technology, maybe a CRM platform, but we really don't think about uh, hiring resources that are solely responsible for baking cybersecurity into the culture of an organization. Oftentimes, and usually out of financial necessity, um, business owners have to wear multiple hats. And the one hat they usually forget to wear is a CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. And probably for the obvious reason, building out a cybersecurity program uh, can seem like a daunting or insurmountable task for somebody who has little to no experience. So I'd like to start with Krista, and maybe you can share with us some ideas on what someone can do if they're responsible for their own organization's information security. Where do they start? So if you already have an established business and you're looking to integrate more cybersecurity or a cybersecurity program into that business, um, there are a number of things you can do. I know it seems like a really big problem, um, and it is, but there are some simple things that you can start with. Um, the identity um, and uh, authentication policies that you have, how you're authenticating to any platform or program, to your account. Um, is it just a password? What are those password uh, policies? And then additionally, we really encourage having multi-factor authentication enabled for every account. Um, if, if you want me to explain what that is, I can do that as well. I'm sure. Uh, so multi-factor authentication, it's also called two-factor authentication. What this is, is a combination of at least two or three factors. These three factors are something you know, which is very often password, something you have, which might be a code sent to your phone via SMS text or through an authentication app, or something that you are, which would be like a biometric, like a fingerprint. The reason why we stress having two-factor or multi-factor enabled is because 
passwords get exposed all the time. There's data breaches that expose passwords. You might be using a weak password that could be easily guessed. So there's a chance that a cyber threat actor might have those passwords. If they try to access your account through that with that password, what'll happen is that they'll, it'll be accepted, but then you, they'll be prompted for that second factor. So unless they have that second factor, have your phone or have your fingerprint, they should not be able to gain access to your account. It's one of the best things, if not the best thing to implement to uh, reduce or eliminate your risk of account compromise through credential theft, so through password theft. So that's why I stress it so much, it's because it's a pretty easy thing to implement and it significantly reduces risk. There's a number of things you can do with somebody's account when you gain access to it, a number of different uh, cyber threat avenues to go down. Um, so securing those accounts is really paramount, um, particularly for network access. Um, in addition to that, uh, inventory. Um, so to bring it back to the uh, business uh, term, know what systems are out there in your network. Uh, what systems are connected to your network, do a, a um, network map if you can, and just start from there. What systems do you have? What do you need to protect to begin with? And then kind of work your way out in. So what uh, do you, can you access any of your systems from the internet, for example? Um, we might go into that a little bit more later. Um, there's a lot of issues that have come about with everybody working from home and being able to access their internal networks from their home sites and how that might expose more uh, vulnerabilities or avenues for cyber threat actors to get into business networks. Um, so starting from the outside and work your way in. But I would really, I would start with how you're accessing your accounts, making sure you can access systems from the internet, um, and then kind of work out from there. But I'll, I'll let the uh, other panelists kind of weigh in here too. Absolutely, Harvey, would you like to weigh in on, on where to start? Sure, sure. I mean, there's a couple of things. Um, a couple of the ones which uh, Christina has nicely touched on, absolutely fine. Only thing I would add is these are services naturally which you're going to be paying for. So you need to go out and make a consumer choice just like you would with anything else. Um, a lot of people normally come to me and say, oh, my data is safe. I'm using Amazon AWS. What does that actually mean? Um, people sometimes assume Amazon AWS is they've got the servers directly with Amazon. They're not looking at, they could be via third parties, et cetera. And who's actually their supplier? What type of accreditations do they have? Are they ISO 2001 accredited, et cetera? Really look into uh, the suppliers a little bit more. And then uh, working from home, that's a big thing right now. Everyone across the globe is doing this. And when you, when you are gonna be accessing your work you're using your home home broadband when is the last time anyone listening into our uh, chat today changed their password at home how often do they change it um, how many people's kids know their passwords for their broadband at home etc and then if you're using the same connections to access your work accounts you're not necessarily going into a secure connection you could be uh, loading up your Office 365 using your, um, um, using your web browser uh, from your home broadband and simply going into work spreadsheets, et cetera, which all contain personal data around the company. So being really, really careful um, is, is one thing. And obviously I'm stating some of the real obvious stuff, but um, changing passwords, for everything on a regular pay, uh, basis is um, really, really important. And you mentioned the two-factor um, password, etc. Linking it up to your uh, password with your SMS is, I see, one of the safest ones because you can only get the SMS sent to your phone number. And if you're holding the phone in your hand, then that's one of the um, safest means uh, of um, doing the two-factor authentication. And I think you bring up some really great points. And Vakas, I'm going to go to you because some of these things we're talking about in a business environment, but you know, I know on some of my social media accounts, two-factor is, is, an, is, op is an option, right? So let's talk about some of these things as it pertains to working from home or your mm -hmm. own personal account. 
So the, I think that, you know, there's some really clever stuff here and I, I'm not that clever. So I like to kind of bring it down a couple of notches uh, just, to, just so that I, you know, I try and explain stuff to my mum and I try and explain some stuff to my mother and if I can do that, then, then everyone will get it. So with, with a lot of these security protocols, you know, we've, we've seen two-factor authentication, we've heard about passwords, we've heard, let's start with the absolute basics. The basics come down, come down to what is it that you don't want someone else to have access to? So everyone on this call is likely to be an entrepreneur, has a business. Um, there's going to be some information that is critical to your business. That could be your business plans, it could be your accounts, it could be your customer, customer records list. I always say start with a list on a piece of paper of where this information lives, right? And draw rings around it. And draw, draw like, you know, is it, is it physically in my hand? Is it on my phone? Or is it in the cloud, right? Like, so where, where is this information? And then um, while, while, you know, there's the ways that you get what you pay for, a lot of the service providers, a lot of whether you're a Mac user or a PC user or an iPhone user or Android or whatever, whatever type of systems you use, a lot of these manufacturers have now baked in common security practices like 2FA, multi-factor, for free. So these are things that, these are two great piece, great like starting points that you've paid absolutely no money for. And we're a bunch of Indians on this call and I'm an entrepreneur as well. We don't like paying for stuff. We like free stuff. <laughs> um, free is write a list. Free is enable security settings on the devices that you already have. Then you can go on to the next step. Because I think if you haven't tackled step one and step two, then the rest of it is, is, is irrelevant. And I think to, you know, just to kind of wrap up this thought, now that we all, now that we are working from home, you know, my kids, my kids want to use my iPad. Um, why, my kids want to use my iPad for like YouTube kids, but I've also got kind of work applications on there. So how do I, how do I um, have some sort of separation? Well, what I do is I make sure that my, uh, my work apps don't auto log me in. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain. Yeah, it's annoying. Um, yeah, you know, I'm gonna have to re-enter the password if I buy a new app. But then at least my two-year-old isn't gonna download 17 copies of something from the app store and leave me with a huge credit card bill. So, so I think there's some like simple stuff that, that we can do, but it really comes down to, I always say like, what's the data? What's the information that I wouldn't want my competitor to have? or someone that was setting up an identical business to have. If I got all of your information, could I set up the identical business as you, which then means that all of that time and effort that you've put in for this thing is wasted. So I think that's, that's where I would say that people need to start. So I've got a funny anecdotal story about the whole, you know, Netflix, iPad type thing. Um, when we got new cell phones in the beginning of the year, uh, Disney Plus became a free thing and I was, obviously aware of the breach that Disney had uh, with the, with the um, credentials. So I kind of sat tight for a bit, a bit didn't, didn't allow my kids to have it. And then finally, after everything was secured uh, and I felt comfortable, I said, okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll engage, indulge in Disney Plus. One day we go to turn Disney Plus on on the TV and um, all of a sudden there's an icon up on the screen with my son, my 14 year old son's best friend's name on it. I'm like, hmm, how did that get there? Turns out kids are trusting, right? He gave his best friend the Disney Plus credential. We were talking, Harvey, you mentioned, you know, did your family member have your password to certain accounts? He wasn't doing anything that he thought was wrong. He trusts his best friend. They grew up in this environment of, um, you know, inter internet and technology. It didn't occur to him that giving that password out to somebody could potentially have them put it sure. on a device that, that we can get, get hacked, just, right? Just to, yeah, and just to add that and add to Vikas's comments, just one thing, what's important to, what imp information is important to you may not be that important to what the cyber criminal needs. So they've already got 80% of your information and they're missing 20% of the information. And that 20% of the information which they're hacking you for, you don't actually see as important information, but that 20% completes the jigsaw for them and now they can go and do what they need to do. And this is why it's important that if you are gonna protect yourself, you need to protect yourself fully. 
because you don't know what someone else needs and that's the whole key you know so it's good pointing out these are my key things that i really need to protect but they may not even want to do anything with your business they just need the last few digits on your card and they're going to find it on one of the systems which you've used so this is where it's important to remember that um, you have to have a total open mind that something you save on your desktop, some things you save here, some things you don't save in the cloud, etc. They can be after anything. And it can be what I call meaningless data to you, but very, very important to somebody else. Exactly. So let's just talk a little bit about, despite some of the mysticism around cybersecurity, there are very real benefits to implementing a strong cyber program in your organization. So um, let's start with Vikas. Let's talk about Im how improving your cybersecurity posture can also support business objectives. So uh, that's a great question and, and extremely timely. So uh, I, I have a startup uh, and we sell to enterprises. Um, we have recently just received our SOC 2 certification for security, uh, availability and confidentiality. And what that means is that, uh, you know, again, and to the entrepreneurs on the group, um, uh, SOC is a, is a certification that is certified by the AICPA. So it's essentially demonstrating, us being able to demonstrate to chartered accountants or chartered, uh, chartered public accountants that our security posture meets a certain level that having that certification is actually enabling us to talk to much larger customers that we want to sell to. Um, it, it, there is a level of confidence that um, there's a level of confidence that all organizations need to and must um, be able to communicate to their customers, whether you're a restaurant owner, you know, whether, you know, whether you're a restaurant owner, whether you're a CPA firm or a doctor's, a doctor's firm, um, I'm, I'm sometimes horrified how some medical professionals can still get away with using at Gmail or at Hotmail accounts to communicate um, personally, you know, protected health information. Um, by having a stronger cyber posture, it, it demonstrates a level of confidence because a consumer is trusting you with their data. And whether you like it or not, you are taking their data and you are, you are storing it electronically which then means that you are the custodian of that data. So if something was to happen, uh, Chris, maybe Chris can tell us, but I know that in, in certain states, you've got a, a breach notification rule of like anywhere from 250 to 500 records, which means that if you've got 250 uh, customers and you've got their name and their email address, and you can't prove in the event of a data breach that you secured your systems appropriately, you now have to disclose that breach and that is a that's a reputational impact that will be carried carried on for a, for a very long time absolutely actually i was going to ask krista um can you give some insight from from the insider you know realm that you're in on um how how creating a good cyber cyber posture could actually put a business in a better position than someone maybe that doesn't Sure, and I was going to actually say, say the same thing about consumer confidence, customer confidence in them holding your data secure. Um, people are getting more savvy to the fact that all of these data breaches are occurring, what those impacts could be to them personally. Um, so people are paying more attention to how these different companies are securing data if they're doing that properly. Um, if you have a data breach that occurs and it gets out publicly, what that does to your brand um, and the likelihood that you're going to keep customers. Um, and then if you good at, if you are trusting, then that customer is more likely to stay with you, more likely to recommend you to somebody else. Um, but in addition to that, just as far as the business goals for you, if you are impacted by a cyber incident or a suspected incident, it doesn't have to be just ransomware that puts you out of business or that it could be a significant uh, cost to you and your company. Um, you could have just the remediation, investigation, containment of a cybersecurity incident, regardless of what it is, leads to downtime. And it, downtime to you might be dollar signs. Um, so just having a good cybersecurity program to prevent those things from happening. And then also to make sure that my director mentioned earlier, resiliency. Um, so people talk about being secure, and I, I use that word often, but really what I'm hoping that we're all doing is becoming more cyber resilient 
So if you are impacted by a cybersecurity incident, if you are impacted by something like ransomware, what is the amount of time that you're going to be down? Um, how quickly can you recover? That's what I mean by cyber resiliency. At this point, these cyber threats are changing so much that I feel like it, at this point we need to prepare for them to happen. Um, so if you're more resilient, if you have a plan in place, you recover quicker, that means that you're gonna lose less money as a result. So having a good cybersecurity program in place makes it so that you aren't so significantly impacted, that if you are hit by a cybersecurity incident, that does not put you out of business. So it is in everybody's best interest to have something in place, a good cybersecurity program in place based around best practices, because that can that, that gets you to those business goals because you're not losing money because of, uh, because of an incident occurring. Business continuity is a really, really important topic. And we all know now better than ever, you know, 2020 has basically been the wait there's more year, right? <laughs> Harvey, let's talk a little bit about business continuity and how um, having this strong plan, uh, including business continuity, can help businesses recover more quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, the the point is uh, really, really important. If you are, people are going to get uh, cyber attacked, it's not going to go away. So having a recovery plan, not just go to where you were. So you got a cyber attack today and you your IT wakes up and says, we need to get back online, but not recognize why you got attacked, only to go back up again and get attacked again. Um, it's really, really important that you're going to have to do a root and branch analysis. So it's not just about getting live again, because now you've been attacked, there could be a virus in there. So there could be lots of things in there which you need to actually sweep out uh, before you actually go live. And the plan of actually doing that is actually key. And this is where backups, where your backups are. Do you back up onto the same server? Do you back up on a total different server? Having that whole plan in place is actually essential. And some people may think, hey, I'm only a small to medium business. Um, so is this really going to happen to me? Is it that important? But if it does happen to a small to medium business, they're less likely to recover because they have to now spend money or get hold of some resource to sort this out for them because all they thought was they had a website and they were taking orders and everything was going fine. And all of a sudden, they can't access their own website or server. And what do they do? Whereas the bigger corporations will obviously throw money at it, they'll have full-time people, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're an SME, I think it's almost just as important as a corporate to make sure all the things that we've discussed, who's hosting, where are they hosting, what type of plan do you have, what's your backup, where is it, have all that in place because no matter what size you are, your problem's still going to be the same. You're still going to have to recover one way or another. Vickers, anything to add to that? Yeah, you just you just reminded me of a story actually. Um, so when I had my consulting firm, we 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 would joke that incidents always take place at five thirty on a Friday night. Um, and one Friday night, I received a phone call from a, actually a referral from a Facebook friend, you know, a friend of a friend, and this guy phoned me up and um, he had a maybe 50 employees and they'd been hit by ransomware and um and he phoned me up and he said you know what can you what can you do and i said well you know have you got any backups you know, all of the stuff that you've just mentioned right have you got any backups are they good he's like let me put you onto the it guy so i spoke to the it guy and i said uh, so how good are your backups and he's like what do you mean how good i was i was like when when was the last time you tested them and he said i've, I've never tested them um, so I said, uh, I said, can you put the business owner back on the phone? Um, the guy said to me, he said, so what can I do? And I said, you've really got two choices. And there were about 50, 50 people in his business. I said, you're either going to have to like buy new, buy 50 new machines over the weekend and get, get the programs on there or tell these 50 people that they don't, like, they can't work all of next week, like for you to recover all your stuff. I mean, once I think any entrepreneur knows, you know, you might not know what your cyber posture is, but um, when when I used to talk about cyber to business owners or to entrepreneurs, I would, before even asking them anything about cyber, I would say, what's a week's worth of payroll cost you? 
because any any employee and any business owner can tell you what their what their weekly burn rate is on payroll if your people can't work for a week what does that cost you and i think when you start working out what's the cost of cyber and you know it's kind of like an insurance policy really everyone understands insurance you know for for a small medium sized business to be impacted by a cyber breach will take you at least a week if not two to three weeks so you've got to say right the average breach may cost a large organization millions of dollars but if it costs you like you know 10 grand a week well that's up to 40 grand before you've even done anything so that you know as you started describing the backup story it was a yeah. <laughs> you know, story to mind. just one last thing around this is sometimes you don't actually know you've been hacked right so you're being watched and um, they're taking what they need or watching what they need. So going back to Christina's point at the very beginning, unless you have your processes and these continual checks in place, right? So we call it, in our company, we have like a 5S audit every week. We'll go through all the same stuff and make sure we tick all the boxes because one week, one of those boxes may become unticked. Um, you're never going to know. And the prime example today is in the UK, British Airways, international company have been fined, I think, 25 million pounds because of a data breach. And they had been breached for two months. They only realized in the second month what was actually happening. So for two months, their uh, consumer data uh, had been getting exposed um, to one extent to another. So it's really important that you don't just go out and buy all the expensive servers and equipment and everything and say, well, I've got all this in place, so we're okay. Uh, you need to be doing those health checks on a very continual basis and making sure they're consistent. Otherwise, you can have the best servers in the world. It doesn't matter. It's all irrelevant. I think this is a perfect segue into the next topic I wanted to talk about. Um, so you can have all of the technology. I work for a manufacturer and I say this all the time. We can build the perfectly hardened device with all of the technology built into it and all of the security feature sets known to man. But at the end of the day, it takes a person to install it and make sure that those security sets, uh, feature sets are implemented, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about the human element of this piece, right? How to create a culture of cybersecurity. So not only the business owner, I, I think by now we've beaten it into everybody's head that this is an important topic that needs to be addressed. Right? How do we get our employees and um, the, the people that we work with on board to understand the importance? And then the second part to that is if each of you can pick one um, type of breach, right? The bad guys are motivated by a couple of different things. It could be politically motivated, it could be financially motivated, or it could be that they just want to steal your really awesome idea that you're going to market with intellectual property, right? So let's talk about how these guys break in. And then also, how do we get our employees to champion security, right? Both both at home and at the workplace. So I'm gonna start with Krista on this one. All right, so there's a lot there. Um, so for cyber threats, I mean, I, as a lot of people can probably guess, um, we see far more cases of hacking, so with quotes, a human, than we do hacking an actual piece of equipment. Um, people are very influential. They can be manipulated into taking action that is of interest to the cyber threat actor. So you think spear phishing, phishing emails, um, you might get an email that looks like it comes from a trusted source. They're trying to get you to open an attachment or click on a link. Um, and in those cases, they might be attempting to download malware onto your system, or they might be trying to get personal um, sensitive information, financial information from you, uh, your credentials, so your, your username and password for a sensitive account. Um, there are various things that they can do uh, through just a phishing email. Um, there's so much information online now about each and every one of us um, that it would be pretty easy for them to craft a convincing email nowadays. Um, LinkedIn is a great place to, to find a lot of information about somebody, where they work, um, what department they work in. Uh, if somebody's in HR, uh, they can craft a very specific email to them. A uh, financial uh, department or somebody who works with vendors, uh, they can impersonate a vendor of a business, uh, request that money be forwarded to an account that they're in control over. Uh, for supposed invoice for services that they provided. 
Uh, there is a multitude of ways that they can um, try to influence you through something like just a simple email. Um, so we see that a lot. Um, now trying to get people and the culture of cybersecurity within a business. Um, obviously, we, we, I think that we can talk numbers enough that we can get you know people in the, in the C-suite or the owners of these businesses to get on board, but how do you get your employees on board too? Connecting um, the impacts of a cyber incident to work to their home life um, is a great way to start um, getting them to care about cybersecurity at home uh, will eventually bleed into work. Um, you can take a hard line approach where, well, if we do phishing tests and you get, you get duped three times in a row, then um, you know, you're suspended for a week without pay. I mean, you can go really hard line on this. Um, sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's off-putting to, to the culture, but there are a number of ways that you can do this. Just the phishing test in general, if you uh, fall for that phishing test and you just have to do something more simply as do uh, more training, you know, more phishing training. So it's something that they don't want to do. So maybe they'll pay more attention to their emails, make sure that they don't fall for that phishing test. Um, so you can ingrain it in uh, the way that they are evaluated at their job. Um, you can make it very clearly, well, if we're hit with ransomware and we have to either pay the ransom or incur the costs that are associated with accepting that loss, then we might have to you know, let a couple of people go as a result. You know, If you're a small to medium sized business, that's a very valid argument to make. Um, so if they wanna keep their job, they're gonna know that they need to keep that company, that company's network safe, that information safe. Um, so there are certainly ways um, you know, and gentler ways to get people on board and make sure, you know, we want this company to, to survive, we want it to flourish, we want it to grow. And a big part of that is making sure that our network is secure, as secure as possible. Um, and each and every one of you play a very big role in that. So every employee plays an extremely important role in making sure that, that cybersecurity is, is something that um, is, is taken seriously and taken um, in protecting that network. Um, so there, there are a number of ways to do that. Um, it depends on your approach, um, but certainly connecting it to their home life is, is, has been very successful for us in the past um, when we do these presentations, making it more uh, personal for them. Thank you so much. Harvey, do you have any input on that? Before you had said something that really triggered um, triggered me where you said what you think is important may not be important to the bad guy, right? They may need that 20%. Um, when we think about risk and we do risk analysis on business, and Vikas, you and I talk about this all the time, each department has their own crown jewels. So um, what's, your in, what, what's your thoughts on, on you know, getting the buy-in from all the different departments within an organization? Yeah, I mean, there's some very simple and straightforward stuff which you can do um, with regards to just simple training. For example, if if you actually train your staff to say, if you receive an attachment or a link, you need to click on the email ID to verify the address. That's a very, very simple technique because on phishing emails, if the if the name says Harvey Garche, if you select the email, you'll probably get a lot of jargon underneath in the in the actual email id address and stuff so i think um training is going to be key because at the end of the day these are human beings that open these emails click on these attachments and open these uh, links and humans just like anyone else will make mistakes so you can only mitigate those mistakes through education and um unfortunately we have to sit there with the staff and tell them what's good, tell them what's bad, how they can actually weigh out the pros and cons of, you know, how they should do their day-to-day -day work and um, put rules in place. If you're a company that's doing a lot of sales, you're more than likely to be sending out a lot of emails where you may not know the actual responder when they come back because you've put a lot of cold, cold emails out there in the business and you're waiting for leads. Now, when a very good lead comes in and says, I'm really interested in taking your product and I, you know, I, want the, I want the premium one, it's very, very tempting to press on anything that's available on that email because you're thinking, ah, it's, it's gonna be, this is what I've been waiting for. But that's the one that's probably lured you into actually making a mistake. So not forgetting in those key moments that, um, Every email coming in, it, it can be a phishing mail and the likely ones which are from accounts to say, can you check this for me? Can you open that for me? Because, 
you know, there was something wrong with your, your pay ID or something like that, you need to check, you know, and um, uh, Chris has pointed on it um, very importantly, um, you can't do this without training and education around the subject. Otherwise, I find it impossible. Yeah. So we only have like one or two more minutes and I, I really wanted to um, co cover just really quickly the secure supply chain. So Vikas, I'm leaving this one for you because it's something that hits really um, closely home for us. Um, you, you've done everything right. You've, you've, you've gotten your employees to buy in. You've invested in making sure that you've got password vaults and your, your network is now connected and, and protected. But what about the people that you do business with? What about your suppliers? Because why don't you talk a little bit about the importance of extending out that culture to the people that you do business with? Yeah, it's an age-old age adage, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. And those third parties that we work with, where, and those third parties could be our customers, and those third parties could be our suppliers and our vendors. We are, we are as strong as they are. So uh, it's important, particularly in small to medium sized businesses, when there is an over-reliance on both the customer and also the vendors for, for that, for a candid communication to take place, right? What, you know, in the event of a breach, how, how are you gonna tell us about it? If we have a problem and we detect something, how, who do we talk to in your organization? Yeah, there are, there are lots of sophisticated ways and methods and you do risk analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes when, you, when, you, when you're a five person organization working with a 10 person organization, you go, okay, look, what's the, how much information are we gonna give each other? Am I buying just a physical product from you? Or are, are we exchanging data back and forth? Like, what do I do if I, if, you know, when you send me an invoice, which email address will it come from? Will it, does it go from a particular person? If I'm wiring some money, who, like, let's set up some protocols. So there's, there's certain things that you can do to get in front of all of this. And I think the, uh, the, the reliance on the supply chain, I mean, COVID has showed us that. Um, we've got this over-reliance on the supply chain and I think it's imperative for every business owner, not just to look at you know, the list that I created for where my, where my information was, which, which of my supply chain, which of my third parties can I not do business without? And how do they send me information? So if you're a, you know, if you're supplying food and your most critical food vendor sends you invoices by fax normally, but this one time they send you a PDF invoice, right? There's, there's your red flag right there. <laughs> so I, I think it's, uh, you know, these kind of conversations, this is just a really good opportunity for business owners to take a step back. And I think any one of us will make ourselves available to anyone that has questions or comments on any of this stuff. Take a step back start with a blank sheet of paper and go, what does my business rely on? And I think once, once you start realizing um, what those either systems or vendors or customers are, you can work out probably because clever people like Harvey, Harvey and Krista and yourself, Antoinette, are on the line. Uh, they can talk through like how, what are the next two or three things that you need to do. But starting with that inventory, I think is critical. Fantastic. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So I just want to thank all of the panelists for just such a wealth of information. It's been fantastic. Um, and we are going to now leave it to uh, Rishi for the final comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Richie Data. I serve as the Director of Accountability for the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce here in New Jersey. On behalf of the leadership team and our members around the globe, I'd like to thank Director Maples, as well as each of our distinguished panelists today, Antoinette, Vikas, Harvey, and Krista. Our community is grateful for the valuable insight you have shared, helping to ensure our members are safeguarded against cybersecurity threats. Here in New Jersey, behind the scenes, we've been working on some initiatives that I'm excited to tell you about. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce you to the other members of our team here at the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. Our cultural director, Jyoti Soni, our corporate liaison director, Rippy Carta, our higher education director, Nabib Tucker, our special needs director, Sahil Arora, our government liaison director, Raj Bhatt, our director of communications, Mandeep Singh, our Director of Technology, Anand Arya, our Brand Strategy Director, Amit Kapoor, and our Public Relations Director, Manpreet Singh. 
Now back to our initiatives we plan to bring to you at the start of the new year. Our mentorship program. We're working with industry experts in areas such as finance, healthcare, government and law, science and engineering, to bring a structured mentorship program available to members of all ages. Our goal is to mold future astronauts and presidents while helping those in need pivot towards a new career. Our Women's Business Forum, a platform to motivate and guide our business owners, professionals and students on deriving the greatest value from networking. Adopt a business. In January, our chapter will start taking applications on potential growth opportunities. Select businesses will gain valuable insight, receive strategic introductions to networks and vendors before being introduced to networks of capital. If there's a topic you'd like to hear more about, connect with us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Ideas for great webinars such as the one uh, today come from many of our members around the world. Leave us a comment on what you'd like to hear about. And thank you all again for joining.